For Prima Media's Polity, I'm Tabi Madiba. Joining me today is writer, broadcaster, and editor, Kukuletu Mshungu, here to discuss her book titled, You Have Struck a Rock, Women Fighting for Their Power in South Africa. Your book expands the narrative of gender issues beyond the Women's March of August 9th, 1956, by celebrating the important ways in which women have always organized and how they continue to work for equality. So can you briefly tell us how this book came about and what was the motivation behind it? I've been thinking about the book for some time. Um, having worked in journalism for a number of years, I would found that I was finding it a little bit frustrating the ways in which we spoke about gender, in particular when we spoke about history. So for us in South Africa, apartheid is quite recent history. And I always found it quite frustrating how we just couldn't get the gendered part of our history right. So even in the way we spoke, for instance, about poverty, I was really frustrated having worked in different newsrooms and different formats, be TV, radio, magazines, newspapers, just how we weren't getting gender right. And I was spending a lot of my time either in my own writing, be it features or op-eds, thinking about how do we better tell the story of what it means to be a woman in South Africa. So I'd been thinking about it for a while. I contributed an essay to a book called Feminism Is, which was published by Quella. Quella would then later on become the publishing house I go with for the book. Two of the chapters in the book actually started out as features I wrote for um, City Press and Mail and Guardian. And so, yeah, so it'd been a couple of years of thinking about the book and then quite seriously in 2018, I started developing some of the ideas. Um, and it was really about, so how do we tell the story, which is also not one story. How do we tell the story of what it means to be a woman in South Africa? What are some of those stories? And even if we look at history, because I went back to the TRC women's hearings, what can we learn from what the TRC itself uh, learned about gender in history when they were doing their work? So it had been a couple of years in the making, just thinking about what I think is important for us uh, if we're going to make sense of South Africa, I think. And you feel that the significant contribution women made to various anti-apartheid activities and organizations lack prominence. So what it is that you want to see happen in celebrating this year's Women's Day? Even with regards to Women's Day, many of us know about the march that was attended by over 20,000 women to the Union buildings in 1956, uh, demanding that pass laws not be extended to Black women. But what I found interesting was there was an organization called the Federation of South African Women, and they were essentially the first multiracial women's organization in the country. They emerge in the 50s, and one of the things that they uh, demand is equality for women. In their charter, they demand that women be given the same rights as men, the ability to hold land and housing, the same legal um, rights as men, which at the time was quite revolutionary because especially for black women, um, black women couldn't become adults under apartheid. Um, so I thought the work of the Federation of South African Women was so important, especially because later on, they would have an impact on the Freedom Charter. A lot of the work that FedSaw, the Federation did, had an impact on the Freedom Charter. So that's just one example of why I thought it was important to go who were the women who organized their march? What was their politics going into the march? I also looked at um, the work of Dr. Khengi Wenzovu, who looked at the women of Duncan Village, who hosted an anti-apartheid demonstration under the guise of a religious gathering. And it actually led to one of the biggest massacres in apartheid history. Um, and I thought the women of Duncan Village were so important because part of how they were able to organize this march was because political activities had been banned by that time, they used their position as women of the church to organize this anti-apartheid demonstration. So I speak about the women of Duncan Village and also how women hosted the first anti-past demonstrations way back in 1918. And I trace some of that history in 1918, the 1920s, uh, leading up to this march in 1956. So I think, you know, there's so many prominent places, so many moments, even in history of women's activism that I thought, I don't think we spend enough time on them. I don't think we're spending enough, um, we spend enough time talking about them. 
And so I wanted to speak about them in the book as well. So, you know, the March, the Federation, the Women of Duncan Village, the Anti-Pass Laws, the Bantu Women's League. I thought it's really important history that women were, and at the time, in demanding for, you know, a democracy, women at the time were very clear that they must be equal rights for women as well. Um, and I think that's quite important that that's always been part of the struggle for freedom is the liberation of women, which I think, you know, even in present day South Africa, that's still the struggle where we're saying women deserve the full enjoyment of their rights. And so that history, I think, is quite important. And I try try to tell some of the story, not all of it, because I think the history of women's activism is expansive, but I do try and capture some of it in in the book. And during apartheid, women were exposed to gender-based violence and sexual violence. So can you briefly share with us the constant threat of violence women were subjected to? The first chapter of the book looks at the TRC and what the TRC learned. So once the TRC was formed and started doing its work, what became quite clear is while women were coming to the TRC to give evidence, um, about what they had witnessed happening to other people or their experience as secondary victims of violence, it became clear that women themselves had been primary victims of violence. So while women were coming to the TRC to speak about what had happened to their husband, their son, their coworker, a comrade that they knew, what started being clear was women weren't actually saying what had happened to them. So as the TRC started going, thanks to the work of the Center for Applied Studies at WITS, in part, they found that they needed to start asking women specifically, even though you come to the TRC to give evidence about someone else, we also want to hear what had happened to you, right? So the TRC then learns as it's doing its work that they had to ask very specific questions about gender-based violence or the experience of women during apartheid because it was quite clear that women had a particular experience which wasn't the same as men. And for me, a story that kind of typified this idea of the kind of violence women were dealing with was the story of Gidiboni Dube. She goes to the TRC to give evidence. She tells the story of how in the early 90s, she flees an area that was a threat of political violence. Um, the area suffered a massacre in the early 90s. In fleeing, her and her partner end up in a different part of Johannesburg and they get separated. When they get separated, she then finds someone or she's led to someone who apparently was helping people, other people. He says, I will take you to a safe place. Don't worry. I know who you are. They know me. I'll, I'll get you safe. Instead, what happens is he kidnaps her. In kidnapping her, he takes her to a house. And at the house, he holds her hostage until the morning. During that time, he rapes her. The next day, he releases her and says to her, if you tell anyone about what happened this evening, what I've done, I will find you and I will harm you because I know who you are. She then doesn't tell anyone. Instead, she goes to a local clinic to get uh, treatment. She finds out that she contracted a sexually transmitted infection. She tells her boyfriend though, what had happened and that she'd been told that she's sick. And she tells the TRC that her boyfriend actually says to her, don't ever speak about what happened when you were kidnapped and you were raped because that will embarrass me. People will know me as the guy whose girlfriend was abused. And she tells the TRC that because of what he says to her, that he would be ashamed of her. She never tells anyone until she actually appears at the TRC. It's the first time she speaks about her ex escaping political violence. She then experiences gender-based violence and she said, the relationship with a partner devolved to the point where they could no longer be together. And I thought her story was, you know, in addition to the experience of political violence, which was rampant, there was also this threat of sexual and gender-based violence. And there were many stories like that, where women were interrogated by police or the special branch. And in addition to the torture of being waterboarded or electrocuted or beaten or whatever, many women also told the story of how they were sexually assaulted in detention. And in fact, the TRC finds in its final report that for many women coming to the TRC, speaking about what had happened, were often describing multiple kinds of gross violations of their human rights. So in addition to being tortured in interrogation, they also experienced sexual violence, um, which I thought was also quite important in thinking about 
So when we think of history, what do we understand as the experience of women? Women who'd gone into exile with either the MK or POCO also speak of the experiences of gender-based violence in the camps. Um, in fact, in their submissions uh, to the TRC, the ANC admits that there were these um, abuses of human rights, specifically of women in the camps. And in fact, the TRC says, you know, we're concerned that there was this experience of women being abused in your camps. You know, what do you have to say about it? And so I thought that was quite important that women, regardless of which side they were on politically, there was this threat of gender-based violence in addition to other violence, in addition to being afraid of violence from the state or violence from other political actors or violence from, there was this constant threat of violence. And then unfortunately, that's just a part of our history I thought we must, we must reckon with. And so that's what I meant when we say, you know, there's this constant threat of violence, but it was coming from, you know, in Gidiboni's case, political violence, gender-based violence, the violence of being told, don't tell anyone about the fact that you've been raped and, you know, from your assault, you got sick and don't tell anyone. I thought that was also quite important if we're going to try and make sense of history. So do you think enough has been done to help the gender-based violence victims in the country? Absolutely not. I think one of the challenges from South Africa is that even though we're a country with high levels of GDV, we just don't seem to have the kind of political will to deal with it. One of the things I mention in the book is for many years, universities in this country, public universities, either had no or little policy that was geared towards dealing with sexual harassment. In fact, the development of sexual harassment policies at tertiary institutions was a recent development. Um, we saw over the last couple of years, following the brutal murder and rape of Uinen Mkhojana and other young women, activists demanding that the state, A, prioritize spending in dealing with GBV, but also that the courts deal with GBV a lot more seriously. We know, for instance, police are just not trained in how to deal with victims. In fact, many victims suffer secondary victimization when they go and report. I spoke to the One in Nine campaign, and they agree. In fact, we've actually regressed in terms of our approach, our response to sexual violence. And in the meantime, gender-based violence is on the increase. It used to be that one in nine rapes are reported to police. According to the one in nine campaign and research, that number is now one in 25. Um, and so we are doing appallingly with regards to gender-based violence, despite the fact that as a country, we fully are aware of the scale of violence against women and children, but we just don't seem to have the political will to deal with GBV. And you say that failure to deal with the issues of women, especially Black, poor women, always reproduces hierarchies and power inequalities that in fact reinforce systems of oppression. So can you tell us mm. more on this? If we don't deal, for instance, with issues of poverty, inequality, and the ways in which they affect Black women in particular, then we don't actually deal with the issues of poverty and inequality. So for instance, the NDP names the average South African as a woman named Tandi. Tandi is a woman who was born poor and will spend the bulk of her life in poverty. The first time Tandi lives above the poverty line is if she lives long enough to receive a state pension, right? And there's a reason why we had to name the average South African, that it is a poor Black woman that is born in poverty, spends her life in poverty, and if she lives long enough, she'll live just above the poverty line in retirement, right? And so if we're going to deal with the issue of poverty and inequality, we must deal with, so what does this mean for Black women who are the group most impoverished, most impacted by a lack of housing, a lack of basic services, right? If I speak to the case of domestic workers, this is a million women, predominantly poor and Black, who work, but despite the fact that they work, do not earn enough to live above the poverty line. They're considered working poor. They are ultra low wage workers. So when we speak about the need for decent work, what does that mean for the majority of people who are poor Black women, 
who are working but do not make enough money. So a lot of our challenges, especially the ones we all agree are big challenges, low economic growth, low wages, poverty, inequality, apartheid spatial planning, affect black women most acutely, especially poor black women. That's why the Constitutional Court said when it found that the exclusion of domestic workers from compensation if they get injured at work or die at work was essentially discrimination against poor black women because the majority of women who work as domestic workers are poor black women. And so we can't separate out, you know, discussions around poverty and inequality, violence, um, land, housing, without speaking about what does this mean for the most vulnerable in our society? And the most vulnerable are poor black women. Like we, we can't actually avoid talking about that if we're going to talk about all of our, our challenges. And that's why I was also just so frustrated, which is why I wrote the book, to go, why are we having these discussions, but we're not being deliberate about what does this mean for poor black women? What does this mean for women in the country? Like, what is the gendered perspective on all of our issues? Because that's the accurate perspective. If we look at the unemployment statistics, Stats SA tells us every quarter, poor black women are the group most vulnerable to the highest levels of unemployment. So if we're going to speak about unemployment, we have to speak very specifically about gender, about race. And it's the only way we'll begin to even make any progress with our issues, I think. And can you also share with us the massive inequality of power between workers and employers, especially males, that places uh, women in a vulnerable position where they were compelled to engage in activities like sexual activities that they wouldn't do or consent to doing? Mm. So one of the things I look at is in, this, in the chapter looking at domestic workers is this great power inequality between themselves and their, their employers, right? And there's the story, it doesn't matter which organization you speak to that represents domestic workers, there is the story of how, in addition to the poor working conditions, the appalling pay, that violence, be it physical violence, sexual violence, is so endemic to the experiences of domestic workers. When I spoke to the Easy Domestic Workers Alliance, part of how they started was a domestic worker had been knocked unconscious by her employer. And the founder of Easy, Amy, who I speak to, says she started her work accompanying that worker to the CCMA. And she says it is rampant, the kind of abuse domestic workers endure. Mom Eunice Ladla, who I speak to, she's been a unionist for decades. She says it is almost routine that employers abuse their domestic workers and they know that A, domestic workers will be reluctant to report it because there's almost no way to report your employer and not lose your job. But even if they do, they know that they won't be believed. So even in you know, these horrible working conditions, as women, because the overwhelming majority of domestic workers are women, there is this experience of violence, which is also important if we're going to think about what is the experience of being working and poor in South Africa. And lastly, what are you hoping people take away after reading your book? I think a few things. The one is about the need to center women in all of our conversations, be it about the past or the present. I think the immense amount of work that remains for all of us to make real the idea of freedom and equality for women. In the first chapter of the book where I deal with what the TRC found, I speak to advocate Dumisan Zereza um, because he had been a, a commissioner for the TRC, head of investigations, but also as a human rights lawyer. And I wanted to speak to him about what does equality mean when we speak about equality, because we hear a lot about equality, but what does it mean? And, you know, from our conversation, he said, we all understand the idea of equality in terms of what the state must do. So the state may not discriminate against you on the basis of gender, of race, of sexual orientation, religion, et cetera. But what we don't often acknowledge is that the same expectation, the same legal requirement falls on each of us. So the state may not discriminate on the basis of gender or pregnancy or sexual orientation or religion, but neither can any of us, be it directly or indirectly, right? And so I thought that was quite important that Yes, the state has a lot of work to make a lot of things real for all of us, 
but especially society's most vulnerable, but there's actually an expectation on, on all of us. We must all be committed to the idea of non-racialism, non-sexism, of equality, of dignity. And so I also hope that the book emphasizes that, that there's a great deal of work to be done, but it is not work that must be done out there. It's work that must be done in our homes, in our schools, in our communities. If you're someone who employs a domestic worker, are you treating that person with dignity? Are you ensuring that when they come to work, their rights are not being infringed? Because that's part of the work. How do you treat your coworkers? How do you treat your family members? And so I think that's part of the other thing that we must center women, that the work, there's a great deal of work, but also that the work is on, it's on all of us. We must all do that work. When you are in a family that says, you know, girl children cannot own the house when the parents pass away, or the girl children may not own the land when the parents pass away. That in and of itself is, you know, part of the problem. And I hope the book connects the big stuff, poverty, inequality, gender-based violence, with the little stuff, the things we think are inconsequential, or the things which we think don't matter. I hope the book makes the connection that it actually, it all matters. How we speak of one another, how we treat of one another, how we see each other has a direct impact on whether or not we live lives full of fear, um, lives full of violence, or lives of freedom. Because I want to believe we all want to be free. We all want to enjoy the fullness of our lives. And so I hope the book does some of that. But also, I'm quite deliberate about naming women in the book. I hope that the book also contributes that people speak about me wini huare more. I hope, you know, you hear about the women of the Federation of South African Women more. Um, I'm quite deliberate about naming names. And I hope the book does some of that, that you learn about women you otherwise knew very little about or didn't know about, because I think that's also quite important. That was Kukule Tumshungu speaking to Prima Media's quality about you have struck a rock.